Welcome, everyone. For those of you who I haven't met yet, my name is Elizabeth Payne. I'm the director of Crease. And um, before I introduce our speaker for our Crease Moon Lecture today, I'm going to um, want to draw your attention to a few upcoming events that um, Crease is sponsor have hosting or co-sponsoring. So tomorrow, from 10 to 11, um, there's the Non-Traditional Academic Career Paths, which is a Crease career event for students with um, our guest on campus, Megan um, Husky. And then um, on Thursday and Friday of this week, so October 5th and 6th, here at the International Institute, um, it, we're celebrating 30, uh, the 30th anniversary. And so these uh, Thursday and Friday, there are several talks and events as part of the 30th anniversary symposium, which are held upstairs in 1010 Miser Hall. Um, so I encourage you to you know, check out the list of events. Several of them are um, directly related to our region as well um, and look very interesting. And then on Thursday, October 12th from 4 to 6, uh, Chris is happy to co-sponsor co the WCE lecture, Artist Talk and Reception for Guardian Passage, um, where the two artists who are um, have their exhibit, which has opened next door. So after the lecture, if you haven't had a chance to check out the exhibit, you might want to head over there. But um, on Thursday, next Thursday, from four to six, the lecture will be held by Irina Badrenko, who's an artist and researcher here at University of Michigan, and uh, Katya Lisola, who's an artist and lecturer um, who I have done this exhibit here. Story. Um, our next Crease Noon Lecture Series isn't until November. This is our only event here in October. So um, if you're not on our mailing list, I believe there's sign-up sheets that you could sign up to uh, learn more about the events here in Crease. Um, today, we are happy to have Megan Busky, who's a writer, for her talk on Unearthing, Unearthing and Reckoning with Ukrainian Family History. I'd like to thank the Department of History for co-sponsoring and helping us to publicize today's event. Um, so growing up, I'll give a short biography before I'll turn it over because I'm sure you'll go more in depth about this. But growing up in Cleveland in the final years of the Cold War, um, Megan understood little about her Ukrainian family's traumatic history and it was only well into adolescence that she learned that her mother had grown up in a Gulag exile settlement in Siberia because her grandparents had been deported there from their Ukrainian village after the Second World War. So as an adult, Megan spent years researching her family's experience in order for her book called Ukraine Is Not Dead Yet, A Family Story of Exile and Return, which was published this year. Um, also, for those of you who didn't see, I believe that you can brought several copies of the book if you are interested and inspired after the talk. You can wait, you can purchase it probably in other online forms or hopefully at Literati downtown, but also for sale here as well. Um, and so the book has received a um, Many praise, including praise as a painfully honest and carefully researched journey of the Ukrainian American into her family's complicated and difficult past, um, providing a personal tour through essential and sometimes disturbing aspects of recent Ukrainian um, history. Um, so in addition to her recently published book, she's also written about Ukrainian history, politics, and culture for a variety of publications, including The Atlantic, The Boston Globe, The Virginia Quarterly Review, The American Scholar, and N Plus One. She's been traveling to and studying the former Soviet Union for two decades, including a year spent living in Ukraine as a Fulbright scholar. She's also received fellowships from the German American Fulbright Commission, the Logan Nonfiction Program at the Cary Institute of Global Good, and the London Library. Um, so we mentioned she was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and currently lives in New York City. So Megan, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you guys so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Really excited to share this talk with you. Um, as Elizabeth mentioned, I'm the author of this book. Let's see if we can get into it. Again, as Elizabeth mentioned, this book looks at my family's experience in Ukraine prior to World War II, their experience in a gulag exile settlement in Siberia, and the emigration of part of my family um, to the United States. Uh, this is a personal work of family history, but I think it also has a lot to tell us uh, about uh, current geopolitics. Um, before I get into the particulars of my family experience, though, I want to give you a short overview of some relevant 
a, some, some framing to think about when you think about Ukrainian historical memory. Um, as most of you are aware, history has played an outsized role in Putin's justification of his full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Um, while he addresses many dimensions of Ukrainian and Russian history in his rhetoric, World War II has been particularly important, um, but standing out the most is this, uh, this claim that Ukraine needs to be, quote, denazified, which is something I'll get into a bit more in my talk. Um, so just to rehearse, I'm sure this is going to be um, old news to a lot of people, I just want to rehearse a bit what happened in Ukraine during World War II. So you can see... Uh, the, the brief um, highlights here. Um, Ukraine was home to, before the war, Ukraine was um, sort of claimed by four different regimes. Um, during the war, Ukrainian territory changed hands multiple times. Um, with that, about 900,000 people were killed as part of the Holocaust. One, if not more, like two million people um, or more were conscripted into forced labor in Nazi Germany. Um, there were regiments that supported both the Nazis and the Soviets, and there was also a fierce anti-Soviet guerrilla insurgency um, known as the Ukrainian Insurgent Army. Um, hundreds of thousands of people were deported, and all told about seven million people were killed. Um, along with Poland, Ukraine probably suffered the most of any uh, European country from World War II. Um, and by the end of the war, all of Ukraine had come under occupation um, under the Soviet regime, where it, soon, it soon had to treat its history in a very specific way. Um, I'm sure it won't be a surprise to many of, of you in this room, but um, a reminder that history was heavily manipulated during the Soviet period. Events that challenged the Communist Party's competence, its moral authority, its preferred narrative, things like Stalin-era purges, the catastrophe at Chernobyl or the Holocaust were either downplayed or just totally stricken from the from either con, from both contemporary debate and the historical record. Um, the word famine, for example, was only allowed in official Soviet press in 1987, and that was more than 50 years after Stalin's devastating agricultural policies killed at least three million Ukrainians. As a result, there were huge holes in Ukrainians' understanding of their pasts, and what I'm saying here also applies to. Um, other, um, other parts of the former Soviet Union. I'm just going to be talking about Ukraine today. Um, this played out at the individual level, uh, of course, as well. Individuals faced repercussions, sometimes significant, for having past experiences in areas that were taboo or illegal under the Soviet state in Ukraine. This often meant having been a German POW, having served in the Nazi administration, or having been supportive of Ukrainian nationalism, or, as this quote shows, even being related to someone who, who did any of those things. The consequence was that people often kept silent about their experiences, not just publicly, but privately as, as well. Parents often did not tell their children about what their experience was like during the war. Even in anti-Soviet families, children had to be able to participate fully and naturally in public life, like my little aunt is here. Um, when Ukraine became independent 32 years ago, of course, all of this changed. Soviet-era taboos fell away, free speech was protected, more or less. Um, but reconsidering history was just one of many things that Ukrainian society was dealing with. Um, societal and institutional restructuring was happening at virtually every level. Um, and efforts to sort of systemic, systemically collect, understand, and critically examine Ukrainians' past experiences have only really kind of taken off in a kind of, at, like at a, in a scalable fashion, I would say, in the past 10 years or so. All, all being said, this work is new and still maturing. Um, I'm going to take you on a short detour that shows you one of my favorite symbols of Ukraine's relationship to its historical memory. Um, this is an artwork in Kiev that was created by two renowned Ukrainian artists, Vladimir Melnichenko and Ada Rybachuk. This is actually the same structure, it's just kind of different views of it. Um, in 1968, they were commissioned to design a 400-foot-long um, mural, which they called the Wall of Memory, in Bankovy Cemetery in Kiev, which is the most uh, prestigious uh, cemetery in Kiev. Um, the mural that they developed was intended to represent their deepest thoughts about life and death, and they considered it their masterpiece and poured years into its design and construction. 
However, it also caused a lot of controversy. Unlike most other Soviet artworks, it didn't contain symbols or messages that used Soviet rhetoric. And in 1981, just as the construction of the wall was nearing completion, the Ministry of Culture of the Ukrainian USSR recommended that it be dismantled because it was, quote, not in line with the principles of Soviet realism. So in the spring of 1982, 335 tons of concrete were poured over these reliefs that the artists had spent years developing and building. This is what it looked like in 2019 when I was visiting. Um, the wall would remain covered for decades, just as Ukraine's own understanding of its historical memory would be buried during the Soviet period. Um, when Ukraine became independent, the earlier decision of Soviet authorities kind of condemning the memory or wall was repealed, but again, the lack of funds and political will, other priorities meant that the wall just remained covered in concrete. It was only in 2018 that some activists got together to manage to organize to start to remove the concrete from the wall of memory. You can see here, like, this is the part that they had uncovered. And they continued to make some progress. Here's what it looks like in 2021. Um, this is Vladimir Melnichenko, uh, one of the artists, the surviving artist, um, standing in front of it. He actually died about in the spring of this year, but there are uh, considerable plans in place to try to attempt to restore, uh, the, you know, the full the full work. Um, however, the full-scale invasion of Ukraine um, brought those plans to a halt um, as in Ukraine most fundraising is being re and government funds actually are being redirected to military needs. So again, I think this functions as a really powerful memory of, or powerful metaphor of how uh, historical memory has been um, influenced by this brutal war. Okay, that's the end of my detour. I'm going to talk now a little bit about my book. So. Um, as mentioned in my introduction, I grew up in Cleveland in a Ukrainian family. Um, I was very close to my Ukrainian grandmother in particular growing up. Um, as I got older, I got more and more interested in trying to understand my heritage. And I went to Ukraine, I learned possible Ukrainian, I met and formed relationships with um, my Ukrainian family members, I have many there. Um, and when my grandmother died in 2013, I wanted to document what I knew of her life for posterity. Um, this turned out to be a really significant project because um, there were many things that my grandmother hadn't talked about. Um, the silence that I had mentioned had acted on my own family as well. Um, so when I set out to do this work, I did a, a number of different things. Um, I went back to Ukraine multiple times and did interviews with uh, family members and other witnesses to the events that I was seeking to describe. This is me with my um, my great-grandfather's youngest sister. Um, I also did a lot of archival research, and this was a super interesting, um, super interesting way to get to know this, to know this history. And it was also a relatively new way, too. At the time, um, I was doing this work in the mid-2010s. There had been legislation that had passed that had opened up the archives of the former secret police, which allowed it. Um, people to get, members of the public to get access to these files very, very easily. Um, so I got secret police files on multiple members of my family, including um, the, the file that chronicled the reasons for um, their deportation to Siberia. Um, and then I did so, so much reading, um, and I, I think it's, it's really important. I mean, this is just like a small subset of the, the work that I consumed, but um, I relied so much on the work of um, scholars in this, you know, Eastern European history, um, Ukrainian history, to be able to put together this narrative. Um, and again, I want to point out that, like, this work would not have been possible um, even if I had started at, like, 10 years earlier, or certainly 20 years earlier. Um, you know, a lot of these books, had, had some of them had been written by that point, but a lot of them hadn't. The archives were open and accessible in the same way. So again, this was um, a particularly meaningful time to embark on this project. Um, so I'll tell you now a little bit what, about what my book covers. So it starts um, looking at the circumstances in my grandmother's native village, which is called Staryava. It's in Lvivsko Oblast in Western Ukraine, actually just a few miles from the border with Poland. Uh, my family, my grandmother was born there in 1925. 
uh, before World War II, it was a multi-ethnic village, um, predominantly Ukrainian, but it had significant Polish and Jewish minorities. It was beautiful, largely agricultural, and very, very poor. All the ethnicities in the village were mi are miserable. I remember my grandmother telling me this story about how she and her brother used to watch her grandfather eat cr bread, and then they would just like wait for him to give them the crusts, which like was like this really big delicacy for them. They were so excited to have their crusts from the bread that he had, he wasn't able to eat because he didn't have teeth. Um, so it was a sort of a medieval level of poverty there. Um, it shaped the lives of the people and pushed many of them to leave. Um, I'm actually now going to read a short excerpt that shows how that, sh uh, from the book, which talks about how this shaped the fortunes of my family, particularly the decision of my great-grandfather, Mikhailo, to leave Ukraine and come to the United States. Okay. There he is. Um, okay. Ukrainian Eastern Galicia, which is the part of uh, Ukraine that my family was in, was abjectly poor. The most desperate time was usually the fast that led up to Easter, when the catch of potatoes and sauerkraut that sustained families through the winter, the lengthy winters began to run, run out. Those who did not die of starvation were, quote, frail like straw, wrote one 19th century memoirist. An obvious explanation for this state of affairs was that the agricultural practices of the pe peasantry were stuck in the Middle Ages, literally. An economic historian of the period observed that the scythes, sick sickles, and other tools used by Ukrainian farmers in, in 1850 were, quote, exactly the same as those used in the 13th century, end quote. Every year, the average agricultural yield in this part of Ukraine was the lowest in all the provinces of the Austrian Empire. Add to this the fact that the farms in eastern Galicia had developed in a patchwork fashion so that a family would have five or six fields scattered throughout the village and it could take hours just to get to and from them. Peasants considered children a blessing, but they were also an economic asset, a way to expand the labor pool available to work the fields. When these children became adults and married, it was common to divide the land their parents owned equally among them, if of course the parents had been lucky and wise enough to own land. Would-be farmers could expect little from the plots that resulted when a property was divided into 10 or 11 sections. I'm actually going to go up here. You can see this is um, a map that shows how like the, the different uh, land was parceled out during um, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. A new opportunity dawned, the United States. The dire economic realities of Galicia had propelled its peasantry beyond its borders in search of work for years. But only in the mid-1800s did those desperate or brave enough elect to make the long trip across the Atlantic Ocean. Migrants usually stayed just a few years only to return to Ukraine and could make many as five trips in a lifetime. Before I began to study my family's history, I thought of their emigration to the United States as a single moment, an irrevocable jump from there to here. That was the myth of Ellis Island, right? You broke upon the shores of America and you were here. Who would go back? It turns out a lot of people did. And that was my great-grandfather's plan. In 1922, at the age of 24, Mikhailo had married a striking young woman Lep uh, from Lepeshnitsa, a village just west of Staryava. Rosalia, who's pictured here, was stunningly beautiful, with high cheek cheekbones, full lips, and crystalline eyes that she described as gray in her official documents. The eldest child of Ukrainian farmers and four years younger than Mikhailo, she was straightforward and confident and is said to have taught her new husband to read. She was so self-possessed that her younger sister used the formal you, v, when addressing her. Per tradition, Rosalia came to live with Mikhailo at his father's house in Staryava after they married. It must have been crowded as Mikhailo's set of brothers and sisters was still growing. His mother had died a few years ago and his father, Stepan, still in his early 40s, 40s, had remarried, taking as his second wife a fellow villager named Tatiana. Rosalia and, Mos and Mikhailo yearned for a house of their own. Stepan and Tatiana had four additional children together, which with Mikhailo and Rosalia's eventual three, these are the three kids, meant that a simple four-room Ukrainian hut had to accommodate at least seven children, not to mention a number of adults. 
Work abroad would give Mikhailo the ability to earn more money in a few years than most Ukrainian farmers would earn in a lifetime. It would mean not just a family, but fields to farm, fields that could possibly sustain his family for generations. Leaving would have its costs, though. Rosalia would be alone to tend to these small children. That's my grandmother there on the right. Even if Mihailo would be gone just a few years, they probably wouldn't remember him when he came back. My great-grandfather, my great-grandparents must have fretted about his absence and how it would shape their young family, what they would all lose. In October 1929, the decision was made. Mihailo would go. He wouldn't have known then, no one knew, that the prosperous America he was anticipated was about to begin a decade-long plunge into an economic depression of unprecedented scale. The photo in the passport that was issued to him that month, it's actually this one, um, showed him as a slim-faced man with a trim mustache and confidence in his eyes. By November 11th, uh, or by November, he was the SS Leviathan brought him into New York Harbor. Here it is. He was just 31 years old. Oh. It's working? Okay. Uh, it's hard to know whether the financial crash that fateful autumn would have given Mihailo any cause. Um, even if the news did penetrate his universe, I'm not sure that the US stock market collapse would have held any meaning for him. Even if he had some concern, he would have been an outlier. At the time, the severity of the crisis was far from obvious. On November 18th, the day Mikhailo arrived in the United States, the New York Times led with the news of a Federal Reserve Board report that showed that despite the unprecedented stock market dive the previous month, wages in both the industrial and agricultural sectors were holding strong. The hardship would become apparent with time. As Mihailo traveled to Cleveland to meet his brother, his plan was finally in motion. By being in the United States, he was that much closer to going back to Ukraine being able to give his family the life he wanted them to have. But it wouldn't be a year or two before he returned to Ukraine, not even five. More than 30 years would elapse before Mikhailo would see any members of the family that he left behind, and some he would never see again. OK. So um, a significant chunk of my book looks at the circumstances, oh, sorry, looks at the fate of my family during World War II. Um, I was most interested in my grandmother's experience, but as I looked more, more carefully at her life, I realized I also had to understand the lives of her contemporaries. As I embarked on this work, I wanted to be able to answer the question of like, what happened to them in a simple sentence, um, to summarize their fates you know, in, in just a simple sentence, or the, the fates of all of the Ukrainians of this region. But as I looked more carefully at these stories, I realized that that was impossible, that these people, while all being Ukrainian, roughly the same age and from the same place, had vastly different experiences during the war. Um, so I'm just going to run through them kind of quickly. This is a, a lot of difficult material here. So this is my grandmother. Um, as mentioned, her father left when she was four to work in America. Um, in 1941, uh, she was married to a much older man when she was three months pregnant. I get into, in the book, I sort of talk about that, and I, I think it was most likely a case of rape. Um, by the time she was 17, he was dead. She was a widow and had a child. Um, she, was she survived the war, um, witnessed various acts of terrible violence. Um, only to be exiled in 1947 for her brother's involve, involvement in a, what's known as Oun Upa, or in Ukrainian, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists slash the Ukrainian Insurgent Army, kind of usually referred to as the same entity, we'll talk more about that, um, where she spent almost 20 years working in coal mines. Um, and she did get the opportunity to leave the Soviet Union with her two youngest daughters left one daughter in the Soviet Union to reunite with her father, Mihailo, who I mentioned in this excerpt. Um, and she spent an additional 20 years uh, working as a factory worker in Cleveland before dying about 10 years ago. This was her first husband, Osip. Um, as mentioned, he was uh, quite, uh, quite a bit older than uh, my grandmother when he married her um, in sort of coerced circumstances, I believe. 
Um, he was arrested for petty theft in 1942 during the occupation, during the Nazi occupation of this part of Ukraine, um, most likely for something stupid like stealing a hat. Um, because of the Nazi penal structure in occupied, in this occupied region, there was a zero sum or zero tolerance policy. So he was shipped away to Auschwitz. Um, he was there for two months. Um, before he was sent to Mauthausen concentration camp in Austria, where he survived for a month before dying at the age of 30. Um, my grandfather uh, was born in a village very close to my grandmother. Um, he also had a very limited education, um, had lost his mother very young. He was um, conscripted into forced labor in Nazi Germany um, during the war. He spent three years doing a variety of different roles managed to survive that, only to come back to you, uh, his native area, meet my grandmother, marry her, and then be exiled to Siberia um, for our, my grandmother's brother's work in Oun. Um, he spent approximately 13 years in Siberia um, until his exile, or exile, sentence was can exile sentence was canceled. He and my grandmother divorced and he returned to Ukraine. Uh, where he lived the remaining years of his life um, in, a, very, in a, a small village not far from where he was born. And he died uh, kind of miraculously just recently at the age of 100. And then um, this is my great uncle Stefan, uh, who's kind of the most um, sort of diff maybe the most difficult story. Um, he was my grandmother's older brother. She remembered him very fondly throughout her life. Um, as being uh, someone who protected her and loved her in a very difficult um, family environment. He was um, known as a community and family leader. Um, people in the, in the village 60 years later remember remembered him again fondly um, and respectfully. Uh, he was a member of Persvita, uh, which some of you might know, a Ukrainian educational organization and then most likely also a youth member of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists. They often kind of recruited the most patriotic and promising of, of young people um, secretly to, to join OUN. He also had limited education and went to Ukraine volunteer or went to Germany voluntarily at the age of 16 um, to work. He falsified his documents so that he would be eligible to go. Um, to, to work to earn family or turn money for his family after the war started. Um, he was there for a few years and then came to back to the area, not to the, the specific village, but um, about 100 miles away where he served in the Ukrainian Auxiliary Police under the Nazis, um, which was an entity that uh, assisted with the implementation of the Holocaust in that region. He was also involved in that. Um, was investigated posthumously for a war crime, which um, the investigation was never concluded. Um, he left the auxiliary police, at, like a lot of auxiliary police did, um, around the time that the German fortunes was, were starting to fade and went into the organization of Ukrainian nationalists, Slujba Bezpeki, or SBE, which is security service, which was another very, uh, difficult, sort of terrible institution, um, which was uh, designed to enforce the, the rule of the nationalists in all of the places where they had power, um, and often involved sort of uh, extrajudicial executions of people that were suspected of, of not supporting the nationalist cause. And there was a Soviet file that said that he was part of a gang that was um, suspected of killing at least 10 civilians, which included Ukrainian women and children. Um, this was very normal practice for the ONSB. Um, he died at the age of 23 and battled with the Soviets um, near Stravyava and then uh, the rest of the family was exiled for his, his work. Okay, so that's a lot, a lot of information. Um, and it's very difficult information, but I think it's really important um, because I think having a nuanced hold on Ukrainian family history has, helps us understand uh, what occurred in that territory at an intimate level and why, um, where some of Russian propaganda has its roots. My family story shows that some Ukrainians did collaborate with the Nazis and they did help to execute the Holocaust. 
My family story shows that wartime Ukrainian nationalism was responsible for atrocities against civilians, Polish, Jewish, and Ukrainian civilians. But it also reveals how conditions like extreme poverty, political oppression, poor education, and family separation influence and give rise to these actions. And it shows how social conditions can spur a deep silence that influences how these actions are remembered and can impair a full, a full reckoning with them. Um, I also think it's, it's really important in this moment to call out that um, you know, an, another really important dimension of family, Ukrainian family histories are the, the various forces that have tried to claim Ukrainian territory, and particularly the influence of Russia or its proxy state um, throughout Ukrainian history. Um, my family story and so many other family stories, and my family story is by no means singular or extraordinary. It's, it's very, very typical. Um, it can show, it sh I think it, it shows how the dynamics that have led to the invasion today have not been at play for just the past year or the past nine years or the past 32 years, but much, much longer than that. Um, the continued celebration of wartime Ukrainian nationalism and the obscuring of Nazi collaboration by Ukrainians during World War II gets a lot of coverage and criticism in the West, and that's warranted. We saw just two weeks ago the scandal in the Canadian Parliament when the uh, Ukrainian war veteran who is part of the SS Halichina was given a, a standing ovation. Um, but omitted from this picture, and I think this is also extremely, extremely important to understand, is that there are a number of Ukrainian writers, artists, academics, and activists who have done so much excellent work documenting and making sense of Ukraine's complex past in the 30 years of Ukrainian independence. And I would argue that an openness to understanding its history, however flawed or imperfect that process is, is a trait that currently distinguishes the governments of Ukraine and Russia. And this culture of openness, of discovery, of reckoning that Ukrainian democracy allows for is currently in peril. Um, I can think of no better example of this than that of Victoria Amelina, one of Ukraine's best young writers. I'm sure many of you know her. She was deeply invested in working through her own relationship to history, to complicity, and to Russian imperialism. She wrote very searingly about these topics, among many other things that she was interested in. Um, and she was, as I'm sure many of you know, murdered by a Russian missile attack in July at the age of 37. Um, so when you think about Russia's war on Ukraine and the many, many things that it has destroyed and continues to threaten, we should be aware that an evolving and critical understanding of Ukraine's past is among them. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, so I know that was a, a lot, kind of intense. Um, and I know there's some people with some expertise in the room as well. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions, but also hear comments and have a conversation about about this um, this topic, yeah. Hi. Um, so I um, I'm a student here, a master student, and uh, I'm a Ukrainian Jew. I was born in Kiev, mm -hmm. um, and um, I do work with um, uh, Ukrainian Jewish diaspora literature. Um, oh, great. So your um, your um, novel is fascinating to me. The idea of it, um, and I just uh, I don't really have a question aside from like. Um, I, I know we, uh, my cohort is scheduled for lunch with you, but I won't be able to go. I have a class. Uh -huh. Is there any, uh, any way that I can have your uh, contact info, be able to reach out to you and talk to yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, I have time tomorrow. If you have a different time, if, you, if there's a better time, we can meet separately. Yes, thank you. Um, and I, um, I want to say that I really appreciate the, the, the way you talked about um, Ukrainian nationalism as something, you know, as something that has uh, affected my family personally, but also as something that is, uh, uh, People talk about in ways that um, tends to be outright harmful. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, just I really like your lecture, and I and I think the work you're doing is really important. Thank you. Thank you. Yuri, please. Uh, thank you, Megan. Mm -hmm. My name is Yuri Kaparulin. I'm a visiting fellow at the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia Studies. I'm from Ukraine. I'm uh, here on. Uh, scholar at risk program and also I'm a lecturer at the Christ Center. 
uh, thank you for sharing your family story. Uh, it's uh, I feel it's difficult to tell publicly family story, even even you try, you try to tell critical story of your family, and so you read so many uh, so many important questions in Ukrainian history and. So, Thanks for contextualizing this with contemporary issues. It's, it's, it's really brilliant for me. I just wanted to ask more uh, uh, about the name of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, as I found, you use this uh, the first line of the national Ukrainian anthem, mm -hmm. but old version, right. because uh, old version sounds like uh, uh, Ukraine is not dead yet. Mm -hmm. But new new actual the actual uh, the version it's uh, uh, that it's about the uh, freedom freedom and uh, uh, glory of Ukraine is not dead yet mm -hmm. uh, what you put uh, what, what meaning you put in this uh, name of the book all these layers maybe yeah meanings yeah you. thank you so much Yuri um, and yeah, I just want to acknowledge like your, all of Yuri's work on, on these very important topics um, and how lucky you are to have him here. Um, I think, so in, in terms of this, the title, um, actually I can go up to the, the title page. Uh, so Ukraine is not dead yet, as Yuri mentions. So this it actually has a very interesting development, this the development of the national anthem, because as this um, young man in the front row indicated, it's actually this poem, which does start Ukraine is not dead yet, not its freedom or its glory, uh, was actually inspired by the Polish national anthem or Polish poem, which is Poland is not dead yet, which so the national anthem of Poland starts Poland is not dead yet, right? So the Ukrainians where this poet took that idea and applied it in the Ukrainian context. And Ukraine is not dead yet was, I don't know if it was the anthem, I don't, I think it was like maybe the anthem for like a few years and then of the independent Ukraine and then they revised it. So now it's Ukraine's freedom and glory is not dead yet. So they just like tweaked one word and or one or two words in Ukrainian. Um, and I, decided to just like re use the initial uh, phrase because it is, I guess, the one I was the most familiar with, but um, it was something, it was a phrase that I thought spoke to like multiple layers of the story that I was trying to tell. So to me, it functioned as a way to talk about the fact that Ukraine had not died for my family in the United States. It didn't, it didn't die for me. I was like, and this is, one of the things that comes up very strongly in the narrative is like how much I, as like a second or third generation Ukrainian, devoted so much energy and time to getting to know this place and felt so connected with it despite the, the distance. Um, and so there's a sort of reclamation in that um, that I wanted to express. It also wanted to, I also wanted to gesture towards my grandmother's experience, um, the, the, the difficulty that she endured in Ukraine and with a difficult childhood and during the war was something that shaped her indelibly for the rest of her life. So even though she came to the United States and sort of ended up thriving in a lot of ways, there was a tragedy that sort of was implicit in her. Um, and so this idea of like Ukraine, the, the difficult parts of Ukraine sort of stayed with her through her life. And then of course there's like the more, um, you know, ex kind of literal version of the, of the read, which I thought of the line, which I thought spoke to kind of, you know, my family's involvement and commitment to the idea of Ukrainian independence, which was very strong in, the, in their in their culture. Um, but obviously now there's kind of a literal, you know, it, it has a different um, valence today. Um, but with the, I want, the reason I wanted to bring up the, the image was when I was working with the cover designer, I really wanted to, you know, work against a sort of typical associations that you have. Like for those of you, you who don't know, who do know those words, you sort of think of it as this like very patriotic, um, a very political statement, but you know, with the, the image of this, this woman on a journey, this is a very female story. It's a story about women on journeys, me, my grandmother, et cetera. 
Um, and so I wanted to sort of speak to that with the cover as well. So, yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Ksenia Yurtaev, and I'm also a scholar at risk in the Wine Center of Europe and Eurasia. And I just wanted, I want to thank you for true talent. So it's, for me, it's very much uh, a story from your family, and but also for, for the Ukrainian nation through your history of your family. And I have, like, I wanted to also say that probably it was the right uh, time for you to start this uh, research because uh, there a lot of their edges were open, but also at the time when still people who lived through these stories are still alive. And my grandma is still alive, she's 96, and I actually recorded some of her, you know, uh, uh, what, uh, memories, and I still try and try to communicate with her. And I just wanted to ask, uh, I've seen there are some uh, pictures of your uh, maybe uh, interviews and mm -hmm. people you met. Uh, I wanted to ask how their life stories for people who live through this whole story, how did they contribute to your research to your book? Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, yes, I. I agree. It was it was fortuitous to be able to talk to some of the people that were, um, you know, who lived, witnessed these events, experienced them directly. But I think I, I mean, it would have been great if I had been very deliberate about doing it even ten years earlier, because there were a number of people that were like my grandfather, for example, who was sort of like, cogn you know, like his his mind was was strong, but his like his here, it was really hard to speak to him. So like I did interview like I tried to do interviews with him, but it like I could have gotten so much more if I had started like ten years earlier. Um, but there were some people that were, um, you know, that, that were in their nineties who were able to, um, to to give me a lot of information, and I was very lucky in that I still have extended family in the village of Stryava where my family is from, and they have. And you know, over the years, I've you know developed strong relationships with them, and um, you know they're they've been very helpful in sort of um, connecting me to resources or people to speak with. They found me this old Soviet book, which I guess this, the the village had um, the village head had written in the 80s. A sort of document it was handwritten, it documented the history of the village, and so I was able to to borrow that and photocopy it and, and use it as a source. Um, and then I found, um, it was funny, I found through the internet this woman who was in her 90s. I was like Googling, I was in London at the time, and, I, and sometimes when you Google things in different countries, you get different results. And so I was Googling, and I found out about this woman, this woman that this German scholar had somehow found and interviewed in, uh, in the village where my family was from, and I didn't know her. And I was like, oh man, like, I've got to go talk to this woman. So I, like, I had actually just been in Ukraine like two months before for three weeks and was like in the village and I missed it. So I like booked a flight, went back and um, interviewed that woman with, um, I think, you know, one of the groups that's been doing really excellent work in this, this space is um, there's a Territory of Terror Museum in Lviv, some of you might know, and then there's a new NGO called After Silence which is a spinoff of like the work that those um, some of those oral history researchers were doing, and so uh, this guy Andrei Usach, who's the uh, the main researcher, came out with his team and did act he actually did the interview, which is great because um, he's so experienced, um, and they had it they now have it, but I was there and like I use that, um, and they now have it in their database, and. Um, it was amazing to connect with Stefania was her name. Um, it's because I feel like I like know the history of the village so well. <laughs> so to be able to like to, to talk to Stefania and be like, oh right, yeah, I remember like the, the schools all went from Polish to Ukrainian in like 1937, you know, just to, that I had the sort of conversational quality or conversational knowledge of the culture from her youth. Uh, I think was really it was it just facilitated a connection which was really special for me. So, um, and she provided so much really really useful information, including about the Jewish community um, in Staryava and how they had died. Um, they were executed in a quarry outside of town. Uh, actually, this tendency, so that not to, to prevent people from, from seeing you. Mm -hmm. I'm a research fellow here with the Center of uh, Study of 
Europe and Eurasia and uh, just for two months, yes. Mm. Uh, and uh, I'm from Ukraine, originally mm. from the western part of Ukraine, so everything you, you mm. actually told, you told was, was very close to me. And, you know, thank you very much, first of all, for the story of your family. And I regret uh, not having recorded some, some, some stories from my family because mm -hmm. um, my grandmother, who was actually a witness, of all those uh, times, she died when I was in third grade at school. But I remember my mom telling her mom, like my grandma's stories about you know that would probably bring some some um, information for 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 this uh, sad history of own and Opa. Mm -hmm. Because I remember my mom telling very harsh, difficult, tragic stories, like there was a lady in in her village, like when where my mom was born in the west of Ukraine and she was very beautiful mm -hmm. and uh, one of those people from KGB or NKVD there he was in love with her mm. and uh, she didn't respond I mean she, mm. she like didn't like him and then in kind of revenge so they took clothes <coughs> of own upa put on their clothes mm. and they drag, dragged mm. that lady all the way through the village like to show people that this was done by Unupa, but actually mm -hmm. that was done by, by Anka, with their people. Mm -hmm. And um, so I regret not having recorded that story, at least from my mom, but you know, my mom is kind of a, mm -hmm. uh, intermediate between, between mm -hmm. the, the original. So mm, thank you very much, first mm -hmm. of all, for, for your story and for sharing it, because I mean, more. Uh, research should be done into mm -hmm. into the history of Western Ukraine, especially mm -hmm. because it's it's a very um, controversial history, which probably would help people uh, in Canada, in the United States, in Poland, in particular, because now as staying yeah. in Poland, I feel a lot of uh, a lot of tension between between people of Ukrainian and and Polish, uh, let's say, common history, which. Mm -hmm probably is difficult to reconcile, I, I understand. But so this is just a comment, not a question. And I should say that your, is that great-grandfather, Mihailo, that you mm -hmm. should? Yeah, so probably you take after him. So he was yeah. a very handsome man and you yeah. took after him. Oh, thank, <laughs> thank you. you so much. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, I think a couple of comments. I think um, one thing I th it, that I wanted to take away from this project is like, now is really the time to be talking to people about like what happened during the Soviet Union. Like talking to people in their 60s or their early 70s, like they have all the information. Like you can go back to them over and over again. Like it, when you start to talk to people in their 80s and 90s, it gets a lot more difficult. So that's like, I was like, okay, next project has got to be about Soviet Ukraine. <laughs> um, so that's just one, one thought I had. Um, and then I think this is, you know, when I first started, when this book was, the book was slated actually to come out, you know, I developed all of this before the full scale invasion. I put, um, you know, some framing around it to kind of help people access the story in a way that would be helpful to understanding today's events. But I was actually sort of feeling like, oh, this isn't the right time for this story because it is, looks at some of the darker parts of Ukrainian history. Um, and you, one doesn't want to like detract, and I certainly don't want to detract for support from the Ukrainian state um, right now. But I think, and I think that argument probably did hold for like the first, you know, six months or so of Russia's full-scale invasion. But I actually think it's, it's quite important to be talking about these stories now because, at least in the West, I think Ukraine has its whole other set of things to worry about. But in terms of like, people, writers, scholars, um, intellectuals in the West, like there's there's a bit of a problem. And we, we saw this in Canada a few weeks ago. Of, and you know, some of the, the discussion of like Ukrainian symbols on the military, like not neo-Nazi symbols, like there's a little bit of a problem in the West with like a public perception of, you know, what you what happened, like people just don't understand. They just sort of see these, these things and they're like, what, like, maybe there is something to be said for like, what Putin is saying about denazification, or maybe like Ukraine does have like a huge neo-Nazi um, problem, and I think by addressing this history, like the root of this history, in a very clear, um, 
an honest, critical fashion helps to disintegrate some of that uh, propaganda. Um, and I think, like, as I said, I think this is happening in Ukraine. There's like a, a lot of people that are doing really, really excellent work. Um, but I think it has particular utility right now in the West um, because there's just a, a need for more education. So. I'd like to just ask about photography. Yeah. I'm very happy for you that you had the photographs that mm -hmm. you were able to include. My experience in Eastern Europe is from Lithuania, but mm -hmm. similarly, and, and people that I loved and worked with there had no photographs mm. at all of their family. I would say basically from the late 1930s into the 60s. Mm -hmm. Do you have any awareness, or I don't know if it, how important it was to you, of just yeah. how they had access to photography, how you were able to yeah, have so these family photos? I think what happened was the photos that, so this photo, I think the photos that survived from before the war came, were sent to my great grandfather in the United States. So this photo, for example, like my, when they were deported, they were taken with nothing. So they couldn't take anything. And then I guess they had them in Siberia. Like there's actually a number of snapshots of like the 50s, mm -hmm. early 50s and on maybe some late late 1940s. So there were, I guess, cameras available. Um, but yeah, anything pre-war is like very, very rare, which is really a shame. I understand though that they did have them, that they were just lost. So. Yeah. Pavit Megan, uh, <laughs> thanks for coming. Thanks yeah. for uh, your talk about the book. Something I found especially striking uh, was the, the silence in the families. Mm. Mm -hmm. Something I experienced personally, both of my parents are from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, my grandmother's sister also was sent to Siberia. Mm -hmm. And uh, something about the photograph that you have, a couple of slides from the end with your grandfather, labeled 1948 in Siberia. Mm -hmm. You had talked about uh, the, um, the attitudes of the, the Soviets towards Ukrainians. and. Something I find really interesting about this photograph is that everybody's wearing Vishavanka. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you That's talk true. a little bit about that? Yeah, that I'm is curious about, well, so they must have clearly done this on purpose in Siberia, mm -hmm. kept all their old clothes, their, their traditional They must have made them for themselves, yeah. I hadn't actually thought about that. That's pretty early. Because it's interesting, so Ivan, this is my grandmother's younger brother, he would be sent, so they were in a gulag exile settlement, so for those of you who don't know, the Gulag had exile settlements and then labor camps. And labor camps are much more widely known. But Ivan was sent to a Gulag exile settlement in, I think, 52 or something for singing Ukrainian songs in the barrack and um, maybe perhaps making a toast in uh, that's uh, venerated Upa. Um, so obviously, there's some sort of cultural sensitivity around certain certain celebrations of Ukrainian culture, but in, not explicitly, like not terribly so, um, in the sense that they're wearing the shibanki, you're right. And I, I remember my grandmother saying too that they would do Christmas carols, so like traditional Ukrainian carols. I'm not sure in observance of what calendar, but they were able to do that in Siberia as well. Um, so, but um, yeah, I don't know. I, I also think in terms of this, the silence is a really important dimension of this story and something that like, I hope you all take away from this presentation of just how, like that the silence had so many different levels. It was institutional, it was social, and it was private. And it had, it was political, in the sense that people didn't want to talk because they could get in trouble. And then there's just the whole like layer of dealing with tremendous trauma that often also just leads to people not saying anything because they just can't process it. And so there's so much of all of this in Ukraine and families just didn't, like I just heard over and over again, like what you were saying about how you heard from your grandmother what she had experienced, but just so many people didn't have that experience, it was very selective. That was true of my grandmother. She spoke a lot, but there were certain things she never spoke about. My grandfather, 
she never ever spoke about him and I found I write about this in my book I went and found him in a village when I was like 21 and he hadn't seen any members of my family um, or knew anything about my mother um, since she had gotten married at like 10 years or 20 years earlier so um, there was you know very clear like she very clear things that she she couldn't touch for whatever reason um, and I think it's 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 incredible to see how how much progress Ukraine has made based on that legacy in terms of people starting to do this research these institutions some very strong ones um, popping up um, and not only collecting this information but looking at it quite critically um, I remember um, again, so that's kind of recollections of my mom. Uh, when my grandfather, during some holidays, when he you know drank a little wine, he started singing "Za Ukraine, and she started like, "Be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. We are going to go to prison. We are going to." Uh, so, yeah. so that was probably that was the problem because you know when people got relaxed, they started like you know revealing what they feel about Ukraine, about, about its independence, whatever, and and. I mean, so maybe that was the problem of silencing, mm -hmm. because that could just come up and people, as you said, could get in trouble. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even even in you know in the eighties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, at the same time, the Soviet uh, government actually left Ukrainians to have uh, symbolic uh, uh, identity, right. right? Like Vishivanka, Sharovari, mm -hmm. the pants. Yeah. National traditional pens, and maybe only uh, like this way they can provide it there, Ukrainians. Right. Yeah. That's a re that's a really good point. Um, sort of hollowed out certain traditions. Yeah. Ask about your grand great grandfather. Uh -huh. um, he came to the U.S. and he was going to go back, and he ended up staying. Can you talk a little bit more about? Yeah. That? So what happened was he. Um, he was intending to go back. He was intending on just spending like a few years and then going back to Ukraine as was typical. But he arrived just as the Great Depression was happening and so he wasn't able to like make money and then uh, in the same way he expected. And then also the, the circumstances were really dire even in Europe at that time too. And um, he did find a job. Actually he found a job and I think his brother who he had, he had had come before and who he was staying with had like a hard time finding a job. So basically he ended up staying and then he really liked, started to like the US and he started a, he applied for citizenship and he started the process of bringing the family over but they didn't complete the process before the war started so they were caught. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 1924 immigration quotas impact Immigrants coming from Eastern Europe. I'm not really. Well um, I don't in know. Law. I don't know. I couldn't answer that question broadly, but I think that he wouldn't have been because he had a brother coming. Oh, he was. Okay. It was like family reunification, so I think okay. he would have been allowed to come, and that was why he needed to apply for citizenship. Was that so he could bring his family? Yeah. 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 I thought something you alluded to or kind of early in the talk about how you know you went when at this time where it was possible and like this idea that you know democracy building in Ukraine is kind of also tied with this reconciliation mm -hmm. of its history and like you're kind of in this unique position to talk about it. So mm -hmm. I was just wondering like if you could talk a little bit about how you saw that unfold in like your 20, 30 years of doing this mm -hmm. research and if yeah. maybe you also had some conversations or interaction with maybe some local historians or some like people who are also doing some of these oral history works like in Ukraine like mm -hmm. talk about how it like reflected kind of the political changes the ability and openness yeah so I mean thinking back so I first went to Ukraine about 20 years ago I mean it's a very very different place than it was then in so many different ways um, and I think one of the reasons that I but it, like if you're talking about just dimensions of history, I mean, I just remember, and I write about this in my, the book, I spent a few months in Lviv, and I 
remember um, there's like the Golden Rose Synagogue, which is the main, um, the, one of the main synagogues in Lviv, which was partially ruined by the Nazis. And at the time, like in 2003, it was, tot- it was just ruins. And it was a place actually where people often took their pets to like relieve themselves. And that was like so offensive to me as an American. Um, and I was just like, I don't understand how this is happening in this place where the Holocaust happened, how there isn't like more, more like respectful commemoration, at the very least. And then I also remember being really struck at the time that um, Anne Frank's diary had just been published in Ukraine, like in 2002, 2003. Um, you're just like, is that true? Um, I. Uh, and it was, it also just struck me as like, how has Anne Frank's diary not been public? This is just so weird. So there are just these indications to me that the memory culture was just like radically, radically different than the one in the US. And I was very naive at the time. I didn't have any sort of historical understanding of just this, like, this process that I'm describing now of, you know, like I think Ukrainians get unfair criticism about commemoration of like particularly like with this, this what I'm describing about the synagogue like yes it's particularly um, offensive I think the way it was used but like go into like if you went into a Ukrainian hospital in 2003 like what would you see I got I spent some time in hospitals at that time and there were like cockroaches running all over the place you know like people did weren't getting food um, Sometimes the quality of the care was such that like people didn't even want to go to the hospital because they distrusted it. I mean, there was just so much. The the society was just like so had suffered for so long, and they still needed to like rebuild in all of these really different dimensions. Um, and so I think it's really important to have that context when we're thinking about you know, like how commemoration evolved over time. Um, and education to um, the fact that like these archives weren't really open and like people weren't, I mean, there was a lot of really good work that was even being done earlier, but it was more difficult for sure. Um, in terms of like how it's evolved um, now, I mean, if you think of that synagogue now <laughs> is, has a very like poignant, I forget exactly what it is, but it, I don't know if anyone has been there, but it's like a, a very poignant, tasteful, um, uh, I don't know, like sculpture. I think the Center for Urban History in Lviv was involved in bringing it about, which is like really, oh, do you know? I think it's called the Spaces of Synagogues. Yeah. And it's an installation of several tombstone-like tablets that are Yeah, it's, it's very tasteful and poignant. I do want to say, too, in 2003, there was a plaque that did identify it, what the synagogue was, and that it had been destroyed by the Nazis, and like it wasn't unmarked, but um, now it's much more appropriately handled. And in terms of the state of um, commemoration today, I would say, like, and this is true, I think, again, for across across Ukraine, is that um, people are are very consumed by the war, and um, a lot of historians, etc., people doing this work. Some of them are fighting, even like um, I think Andre Usach, who I mentioned, who's like an oral historian, he's still doing his work, but like they're also asking now questions about like how how does this relate to like or how do these memories spur like what your what your or sorry what is what is the, your experience now like how does it shape like what your past was I don't I don't know if I want to speak exactly for what he's doing but I, I know that they're thinking about the war critically and devoting some um, the current war devoting some intellectual energy to that as well but I also think like institutionally at the government level, like a lot of funds have been redirected towards the war effort. So like the institution, institution for National Memory, which is like a kind of controversial institution, I don't know that it received any funding this year or like significant, significantly less. 
Um, and the head of that institute is fighting in the army. So um, it's not business as usual. <laughs> I was wondering if you could talk about um, your family's reaction to the book, um, mm -hmm. both in the U.S. and in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And the, my other question is um, if there's any plans for it to be translated into Ukrainian. Um, so my family, <laughs> there are no plans at this time for a translation into Ukrainian. Um, I would be open to it, but I haven't, uh, I haven't pursued that yet. Um, in terms of my family's reaction, I think it's been buried. There are some people that have been, I would say like overall my family, particularly my Ukrainian family, was like so helpful in me doing this work, like introducing me to people, taking, you know, taking me, <laughs> taking me around, driving me around. I mean, it, it's like sort of been a group effort, getting the archive, archival material. I just certainly couldn't have done it without them. And then I think the reception of the material has been, you know, has varied from sort of like, well, this is difficult, but it's, it's, it's important um, to have done to kind of like denial of like, this couldn't be true, this can't be true. Um, and then some of my family hasn't read it because it's not in Ukrainian, so I don't know what they're, I mean, they know sort of what's in it, but. Um, but everyone's still talking to me. <laughs> um, I'll say one other thing. Um, so I do write about like Ukrainian politics, culture, et cetera, as well. I'm continuing to do that. And there's like a printout of an interview I just did with this Ukrainian writer, Artem Chapai, which is like really, really, really good. And I we printed some out. It's a little the, the layout's a little weird, but I really encourage you guys to read it because um, he's, he's really amazing. So you can pick that up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.